New Buddha Way Dhamma Talks. Jeff Hunt presents a talk on some aspect of the Buddha's teaching. What about the positive states of mind? Are we trying to blow those out as well? Is a big question. Doesn't really seem to make much sense, does it? We've all just been a walk in for a walk. We've enjoyed the trees, the sunshine. We enjoyed the music from Andrew. So one way of approaching the question of positive states of mind is, well, what do we mean by positive? And are we trying to blow them all out? <laughs> That's an interesting question, which read as much as I like of the Tipitaka, I don't really find a very easy solution to that one because the Buddha is an ascetic or ascetic. And he is trying to blow out everything, essentially. Now that, you know, that is at the end of the scale. Um, and even in Christianity, there were monks and hermits who were trying to do just that. In the first century, especially the Desert Fathers, they were called. They did not indulge in music or admiring trees and flowers or anything. They just shut themselves off. So that's called renunciation. We're kind of on a path at a wise form of renunciation. One is still engaged with life and the world and families and all the rest of it. We're not trying to, I think you can all see, we're not hermits or monks. Okay? Mm -hmm. But there is an argument here about what it was that the Buddha actually mean. Did he really mean total renunciation? So there is some <coughs> argument about it, but we won't get into that today. But it is an important question. What about the positive states of mind? But we, go, we talk about courage, pleasure, patience, humility, love, care, responsibility, sharing, compassion, gratitude, equanimity, appreciation, joy, kindness, generosity. Now, the Buddha does have a teaching on this. Under right effort, he does talk about fruit, what he calls fruitful states of mind, and that would include some of these. So he obviously thinks of them in a positive way, but he doesn't explain how it really fits in with this program of Nibbana, heading towards Nibbana. So all of those are positive, very positive, and should, should be nurtured. So this is where one of the teachings on this is. He says, now he's addressing monks, but instead of calling them monks, I'll call them meditators, to include your good selves. Friends, now the meditator remains pervading one quarter then a second quarter, then a third, and then a fourth, with a mind filled with uh, friendliness, or loving friendliness. Up, down, horizontally, in all directions, everywhere, he goes on pervading the whole world with a mind filled with friendliness, extensive, expanded, boundless, immeasurable, free from hate and malevolence. Now, you might wonder why it's expressed in such a peculiar way. You know pervading one quarter, second quarter. Doesn't this is really pedestrian, isn't it? And mind, you know, horizontally in all directions. Now, you see, you've got to see through. All, all he's saying is that you've got to have an overall attitude of friendliness. In other words, the contrast is with just being friendly now and then, or being picky about who you're friendly with, right? Well, I'm friendly with you because I like you, but I'm not friendly with you because I don't like you at all. Right, so that's you could still say, well, I'm a friendly person, but I'm friendly. I, I decide on who I'm going to be friendly with, and I reject all the rest. But by putting it in this way, all directions, up, down, left, right, center, etc., what he's basically saying, it's not exclusive. It's not exclusive. It's a general attitude of friendliness. Now that doesn't mean that you behave stupidly either, because it's all balanced by wisdom. So you will encounter people that are difficult or abusive or don't like you or trying to undermine you or what happens at work, we all know that. But still the Buddha would say, you know that's going on. However, you do you, you work with it from a from a position of friendliness. So that will that will help you, but it'll also help the general situation and help the other person. Because our natural response might be just to react. Right. Now we could talk a lot about that because there's a lot of wisdom involved in doing that and maintaining a friendly attitude with wisdom. Then he says exactly the same words, but speaking of compassion, altruistic joy and equanimity. Exactly the same words. So he's saying that we should all be trying to be less discriminating, less judgmental and develop an attitude of friendliness, 
of compassion, which is identifying with the difficulties or the suffering or, or more subtly the outlook of others. But sometimes we think, well, why has that person got that odd outlook? You know, just don't get it really. Uh, they seem to go around very grumpy and picky. What's going on there? You could just say, I don't like that person, <laughs> avoid them. On the other hand, they are suffering something or other. So again, compassion is being able to try to identify with where they're coming from as a person and see that, well, at least sometimes I might be in that same sort of state myself. They're just getting more of it, <laughs> right? And when I'm in that state, I know that I'm, I'm unhappy. But here is a person that's probably unhappy most of the time, and this is how they express it. So that's, that's, so compassion is more than <clears throat> feeling sorry for someone. Again, it's a, it's a general attitude which guides your relationships, so it's informed by wisdom. Then there's this word, joy or tenderness. Tenderness is an interesting word. Isn't it? It's not a word that we kind of use a lot in our society, and we tend to think of said tenderness in relation maybe to a mother handling her baby or something like that. Mm. This convent here is a Franciscan convent. I don't know if you know that. St. Francis mm. is the sort of saint of tenderness, because he's the one that very much engaged with all living things, and animals and plants and insects, they all seem to be somehow drawn to him. And uh, you may have seen here and there a statue of him, perhaps with a bird mm. or something on his hand. So we are actually in the home of tenderness here anyway, <laughs> in the Christian, the Christian <clears throat> interpretation of things. And I think it's quite nice to see some of these um, Christian saints as bodhisattvas in, in the Buddhist outlook. It's just a you know, slightly different way of looking at them. They, if they were saints, they were exceptionally kind or insightful people. We, they, they may be called saints or they may have been made saints by institutional fiat. But in Buddhism, you find the concept of a bodhisattva, which is an enlightening being who is willing to sacrifice his or her own enlightenment through spending all his effort on helping others, assuming that he or she has a person level to do that. But it's the idea of a very kindly person, exceptionally kindly person. So, you know, why not bodhisattva Francis? Why not bodhisattva Jesus? You know, there's a place... We just need to readjust our thinking here. We can become, we can become quite rejecting you know, about other religions, but we needn't. But of course, many people around are very rejecting now about other religions, and it results in a lot of friction, whereas uh, it's unnecessary. You know. uh, anyway, so, po positive states of mind. Okay, friendliness, kindness, compassion, tenderness, joy, equanimity, and so on. Now, how does that fit into... What I told you yesterday. Well, first of all, do I need to remember or locate those in my own mind? Yes and no. If I'm being mindful as I walk through the garden, am I mindful of, you know, the glittering leaves sign in the sense that I just love them, like them, appreciate them the way that they are? Well, yes, but not quite. For an appreciation to happen, there has to be, presumably, an appreciator, right? So, it's easy to be misunderstood here. The Buddha is not trying to diminish the beauty that there is in things. He's not trying to do that at all. He's just trying to say, this, has, this is also reflected in your mind, okay? So, and it's very important to realize that, because we need to make a distinction, which is coming up next. So we can examine we can examine our positive states of mind. You could examine your courage. You could examine your pleasure. You could examine your patience. You could examine your love. Now, if you just go a little deeper into those, you will notice that there is a, a supportive version and a tainted version of each of these. And that's why we need the, we still need the examination. We still need the investigation. Remember I said you, you investigate, you examine the negative state. Well, this is, develop, this is bichara. This is the development of wisdom. So if I investigate, let's take, let's take one of these. Courage. 
Aristotle actually, um, by the time of the Buddha, examined the same thing, not knowing anything about the Buddha. The courage has got two dimensions. It could be recklessness and bravado and showing off. Or it could just be anger and panic. Or it could be genuine <coughs> self-sacrifice for another. Right? See, do you see how... Now, this happens with nearly everything. So, we, in each case, we have to ask, is this state of mind supportive of my awakening? Or is it tainted by some if I'm like, self-interested interpretation of it. Now you could let's take let's take something else. Let's take love. Now that's notoriously divides into two. Because there's love which is quite exploitative and manipulative and possessive. So there are there are boundaries. You cross the boundary and it goes into something which is destructive of the path. You stay within it and it's supportive of the path. But it takes wisdom to, to be discriminating enough in one's mind to see the difference. This is why discussing positive states of mind is a little bit more difficult than the negative ones. Because the negative ones, they hit you, when you see it, immediately as suffering. This hurts. But the others are potentially deceptive. <laughs> Because it can slide, it can slide into the tainted, self-interested variety without hardly without your noticing, or through again through yes, they talked a bit about defensiveness and denial, but it's uh, self-deception. You know, the guy who's saying, "Yeah, I really, really, really love you." You know, I know, you know I really do. And all the time, he's it's actually kind of deceiving himself that this is love because it's really possession. That's it. It's not really love, is it? It's moved into something else. He thinks it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and maybe in a way it did start off that way. Yeah. And it's gradually changed. It's gone over this boundary from self from from self, um, selflessness into self interest. See, so it's so it's that. Now the Buddha says that's why you need to watch out with the positive ones because the positive ones. You require the wisdom to know there is a boundary. Oh, and if you go over that, you're going into obs obsessiveness, craving, clinging, potential self-destructiveness, harm to others. And this, this is the tragedy of life that we see everywhere. That some, something that starts off being a selfless attitude or selfless act, somehow losing its balance. Losing its equanimity. That's why equanimity is a very important uh, <coughs> quality. Our equanimity of, of just maintaining. You know, where does possessiveness begin in in this thing called love? Where does it actually begin? You can't really identify it. But if you if you have equanimity, you will be aware that that there is there is a, a boundary to be crossed. And then the love turn then turns into jealousy as well, and, and possessiveness. The whole thing could start sinking into something really quite monstrous sometimes. I mean, that's how we are. You know, don't want to talk about sex, but I mean, it's <laughs> it's sometimes an embarrassing topic, but it's quite clearly one of those areas in which human beings have a lot of problems. <laughs> because it could be a loving act, but on the other hand, it could be a very manipulative and exploitative act. It becomes just the pleasure in itself, without any human engagement. We're pretty good at that. There's a whole industry around that. But you see how, you know, what is okay at one point goes over a boundary and it very, it very quickly can deteriorate into a whole industry based around exploitation. Because that's how pleasure works. It can easily slip over the boundary. So take the delicious food. Is that bad? When we, when we taste something nice, a nice piece of fruit? Usually. <laughs> if if it's if, if you've been eating a piece of tangerine mindfully, the textures, the taste, the way the little segment is itself divided up into tiny little capsules <laughs> that burst one at a time. But we all know, just we just know from experience that food can become obsessive. Sugar can become obsessive. We have a sugar problem. Why do we have a sugar problem? Because it tastes sweet. You know, I get a positive 
state of mind, if you like, from, from that sweetness. And then I want more and more and more. Right. Now it's out of control. Now the suffering starts. Now the suffering starts. What was never, if you like, I don't want to say designed in that way. It's not a question of design. What, what by its nature is not obsessive, can easily, but, but, but pleasant, and even nurturing, can become a source of self-destruction. Now, this is the, the wisdom of vichara, being able to examine the state of mind and say, well, I do know that there's, there, I do know there's a danger there, but we know any of that, so, so okay, uh, because we don't want to spoil the, we don't want to spoil the pleasantness, the positive. We don't want to spoil it by, you know, thinking, oh, it's inevitably you know, become acidic. It's inevitably going to deteriorate into something awful. You know, that, we don't want that either. You know, but it's always requiring is that one goes through life with, you know, appreciating the pleasant things, but with some wisdom. Is that too much to ask of human beings? New Buddha Way lets go of East and West and starts afresh in the life we have now. For more information, visit www.newbuddhaway.org.